An old professor of mine at Earlham College in Earlham School of Religion, Hugh Barber, once wrote a book called The Quakers in Puritan England. And it places the first Quakers within the context of the Puritan Revolution in England in the mid-1600s. Hugh would describe Quakers as left-wing Puritans. They out-Puritaned the Puritans. Now, there were several similarities to the Puritans. They, too, sought to, the Quakers, sought to purify the established church, the Church of England at that time. Some within the context of the church, working from within to purify it. Others leaving the established church because they felt it was a corpse that couldn't be resuscitated. But there was an attempt, at least in the 1640s, 1650s, to purify the church, to bring it back to restore original Christianity in the expression of the Church of England. The Puritans, however, as an official body, capital P Puritans, had some beliefs that uh, Quakers disagreed with. And these were the major differences within that body of reformers. Primarily, it was that the Puritans believed in predestination and Quakers believed in the possibility of all people being saved, that there was that light within that when turned to could lead into salvation even if one had never heard the name of Jesus. Because it was not the name that saved, but the power that that name signified, that name represented that light and life and power that John's gospel says is within each person. So Quakers believed that when a person, whether they were a professing Christian or a Muslim or a Jew or a Native American or you name it, turned to that inward light, which was the life and light and power of, of Christ within, they could overcome their sin and darkness, turn to the light, and be made whole, be saved. That was a major difference. Another major difference that Quakers had with the Puritans was that the Puritans were constantly, as George Fox said, preaching up sin, constantly referring to humans as loathsome sinners, as Jonathan Edwards once said, dangling by a slender thread over the very pits of hell, and nothing they could do would save them because of their sinful nature in both mind and body. And as George Fox and other Quakers proclaimed, you keep preaching up sin, you Puritans. You keep emphasizing the sin of Adam. In Adam's fall, we sinned all, as the old McGuffey's readers used to say. What about the second Adam? What about Christ, the second Adam, who removes our sin, who, whose light and life and power enables us to overcome sin? Or as George Fox, again, once proclaimed, there is that ocean of darkness and death, but above it, an infinite ocean of light and love. And we can come through the darkness into that infinite ocean of light and love. And so Quakers emphasized that possibility and continually railed against the Puritans for preaching up sin rather than that blessing of the second Adam. The Quakers were not overly popular with the early Puritans uh, because there's no fight like a family fight. And here the Quakers were these left-wing Puritans who had these disagreements over the understanding of sin, human nature, and the possibility of salvation, uh, opposing predestination and the elect, and were banished from Puritan colonies. In Massachusetts in the uh, 1650s, it was a capital offense to be caught driving while Quaker the third time. 
you come to the colony as a Quaker the first time, uh, you were turned around and sent back at the captain's expense. Second time, you were whipped, tortured, often uh, even women stripped to the waist, tied to the back of ox carts, and whipped and tortured. Uh, sometimes full body cavity searches to see if there was Quaker material they're trying to smuggle into the Commonwealth. Third time, you were executed. Uh, not that Quakers bear grudges, but we can still name them. William Ledra, Marmaduke Stevenson, William Robinson, and Mary Dyer. Uh, Mary Dyer being hanged in 1660 created such a stir that a woman was executed that even King Charles II sent a missive back to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts saying, uh, you can torture them, you can beat them, but just don't hang them anymore. Knowing that they faced persecution and possibly even death, why would Quakers insist on continuing to go into places where they weren't welcome? Well, for one, Quakers saw this as a sign of their own commitment to the Christian way. That, of course, being good students of the Bible themselves, they knew that the prophets were persecuted, that uh, the early Christian disciples were were persecuted, that that was the badge of courage, perhaps, that it tested their resolve, it tested their commitment to the Christian faith to be willing to march right into persecution and possibly even death as bearers of truth. So part of it was that understanding that they were in a great crowd of witnesses to the cost of discipleship, and we're willing to, to bear that. Thank you for watching this Quaker Speak video. We release new videos every week, and this season we're asking for your support to help keep the project going. For as little as $1 per video, you can become a Patreon partner. Check out the link below me for more details on that. You can subscribe to Quaker Speak at this link here, and you can see all the videos we've ever released to my left down below me. Thanks so much.